This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Welcome to the IHC. I'm Ann Birmingham. I'm the acting director. And it's my great pleasure today to introduce, her, to introduce Professor Ronald Tobin, our distinguished colleague from the Department of French and Italian. Ron is a noted specialist in 17th century French literature and culture, as well as the Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Programs. Ron received his PhD in Romance Languages from Princeton in 1962 and he's held the title of professor at UCSB since 1969. His lifetime devotion to the field of French and Francophone studies has earned him numerous awards and recognitions from the French government, including most recently, and this is a very long list, so I've really just abbreviated it. Um, in 2006, the Grand Prix du Rayonnement of the French Language and Literature awarded by the French Academy. In 2005, he was awarded the rank of commander in the Order of the Academic Palms by the French Ministry of Education. And I should say this is the highest level of knighthood conferred upon academics. And the award was made in recognition of services rendered to French culture and work on behalf of the French language in the United States. In 1998, he was awarded the rank of Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government. At UCSB, Ron has received recognition for his outstanding teaching and his service to students. He's been named Professor of the Year by the Mortarboard Society, and in 2006, he was awarded the Certificate for Contributions to Housing and Residential Life. Earlier in his career on the campus, Ron served twice as Chair of the Department of French and Italian, and in my mind, this is also worthy of a knighthood. <laughs> Um, and as Assistant Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences. He's been involved in education abroad programs and has championed foreign study as an important element of higher education. He's also been the chair of the campus UCTV committee and has been very active in promoting educational and scholarly programming on public access television. Ron is the author of 14 books and editions and served for 12 years as the editor-in-chief of the French Review, a journal that is the largest circulation of any journal of French studies in the world. As a prolific and original literary critic, he is a pioneering scholar of gastronomy, or as he's called it, gastrocriticism. His 1985 edition, Literature and Gastronomy, is a collection of essays that looks at food in French literary works from Ronsard to Sartre. This was followed in 1990 by his enormously successful Tarte à la Caim, a comedy and gastronomy in Moliere's theater, a book that's been hailed as a gold mine of knowledge about food in 17th century France. His numerous papers and lectures on food and gastronomy in literature are testimony to his abiding interest and unrivaled expertise in this subject. His work was celebrated at the annual conference of the North American Society for 17th Century French Literature in 2003, which resulted in a fetchriff written by scholars from around the world honoring his work. It was titled Theatre Mundi, Studies in Honor of Ronald W. Tobin. Needless to say, we're enormously thrilled and honored to have him with us today as one of our main courses in our Food Matters program, and to hear his paper, Thought for Food, Literature and Gastronomy. Please welcome Professor Ronald Tobin. Uh, 
Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Anne, and thank you, Emily Zinn, for holding my hand all the way to this, practically to this podium. Um, as those of you who have given lectures know, very often the reward for the lecture comes beforehand in the kind of generous introduction that you receive, and I thank Anne for that. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't show your appreciation afterwards, of course, uh, but that remains to be seen. Um, my project at the, at the outset was a kind of lonely one because I was the only one doing anything in, in gastronomy and uh, food in um, early modern literature, particularly in France, whereas now that trickle has become a torrent. But I'd like to give you some idea of what was involved in the research for my book on comedy and gastronomy in Maguire. Um, let me start with a personal reminiscence about my own beginnings and studying the relationship between those two topics so dear to Rousseau, eating and reading. Rousseau says in his confessions that to read while eating was always my fantasy. Now, I had read in countless manuals of French literature of the 17th century that French classicism, the age of Louis XIV, had no interest in reflecting daily activities, including anything to do with the body. That included the, fu the fundamental routine of self-nourishment. I heard that so often I became disgusted with the notion that said there, there has to be more than this. Certainly this is certainly not true. Uh, it's too categorical a formulation. Now I'm a specialist in theater, and I soon recall that Greek and Roman, Roman dramas, especially comedy, which were the models for French classical theater, did not shun the representation of the quotidian, including meals. Plautus's Aulularia, the, co the cooking pot, constitutes but one example, and an example that Modia followed in the play I'll talk about later. There was also Homer's Odyssey that Fielding, in his novel Tom Jones, called that great eating poem. German literature does not lack for allusions to the alimentary, as in a character in medieval French, uh, medieval German drama whose name is telling in this respect, Hans Wurst. <laughs> At the other end of the chronological scale, one finds Der Butt by Gunter Grass, a rich anthropological fable to which a priestess cook, in which a priestess cook exercises famine and banishes hunger. Later, I was to notice the numerous books in Hispanic literature devoted wholly or in part and with great imagination to the breaking of bread as a metaphor for human relations. I'm thinking, for example, of Isabel Allende's Afro uh, Aphrodite, a memoir of the senses, whose title in English translation seriously expurgates the original, which is Aphrodita, cuentos, recetas y otros afrodisiacos. <laughs> in it, Allende demonstrates the interaction of the three functions of the mouth, the, the nutritive, the discursive, and the erotic. The reason for the word aphrodisiac in the title is not only to recall that the book is written under the sign of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, Venus, if you will, but also because of the contents. For example, the pages devoted to eggs begin in this fashion. In all cultures, erotic and restorative powers are attributed to eggs. They are supposed to invigorate old men, cure indifference, and regenerate the dried up wombs of infertile women. There is the story of a man who practiced the game of love for 60 days without slaking his thirst, all thanks to eating uh, nothing but egg yolks and bread. <laughs> Lucky man. Um, Pablo Neruda, the Chilean poet, has written a series of elementary poems, he calls them, that might also be called alimentary poems because they often treat food. His ode to the conger eel is justifiably famous for being a thinly disguised expression of love for his homeland by the longtime exile. In Mexican literature, Salvador Novo distinguishes himself by two gastronomical texts. In addition to a gastronomical history of Mexico, he produced a work translated into English as The War of the Fatties. It has to do with the Aztecs, and while students of Aztec uh, life present the pre-Columbians as grimly serious, they may be startled by Novo's portrayal. Novo gives us chatty, gay Aztecs, something of a mix between Oscar Wilde, Jean Cocteau, and Jean Genet, all of whose works Novo brought to the Mexican stage. Through food, Novo displays an aspect of Mexican culture about which more should be written, the Mexican sense of humor. In so doing, he has noted the fourth function of the mouth, 
laughter. In Italy, where orality flourishes as nowhere else, I had no difficulty in locating texts of a, of a gastronomical nature since Italian scholars were among the early pioneers of gastronomical space. They were pioneer gastronauts, if you will. <laughs> For example, if you have not read anything by Piero Camporese, your life is simply incomplete. His best known and most widely translated, traded, uh, translated book is Alimentazione Folklore Societa. It became in English the magic harvest food folklore society. But my personal favorites are the bread of dreams, food and fantasy in modern Europe, il pane selvaggio in Italian, and especially the officini dei sensi, the anatomy of the senses. Camporesi, like, good, like all good practitioners of gastrocriticism, thinks in an interdisciplinary mode. His cultural perspective crosses the lines of folklore and ethnology, history, medicine, religion, economics, and food studies. His writing is absolutely infectious. Opening one of his books is like reading Rousseau for the first time. You are totally inflamed. Perhaps the most celebrated writing in Italian on food is the Manifesto della Cucina Futurista, in which Marinetti conceives a, a cuisine to promote Italian nationalism and therefore rejects what he calls the international cuisine of the large hotels and official banquets, whose menus for tired tastes go from indistinguishable soups to gelatinous desserts. <laughs> Any attempt at reviewing food in Italian culture must, at the very least, make the mandatory reference to visual culture. Has there ever been a movie about the mafia or an installment of The Sopranos that does not contain a scene of bread breaking. The point is evident. The family that eats together stays and slays together. <laughs> the veracity of the mafiosi and their need for, com for communion are both displayed in numerous scenes of repast. How ironic that they often uh, plot violence during the reunion for a meal that, like all communal meals, restages the central elementary act of Western civilization, the Last Supper. Now, if on our gastronomical journey, which must pass through the elementary canal, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't resist, I couldn't resist. We next stop at Russian literature, we discover a host of fascinating roads leading to differing conclusions. In the 19th century Russian novel, one finds a polar opposition between Dostoevsky and carnivorism on the one hand, where eating and sex are both portrayed as acts of psychological violence, aggression, and, and domination, and Tolstoyan sensuality on the other, where eating and sex are instead understood as acts of libidinal enjoyment, delight, and indulgence. In other words, in a distinction that I was the first to draw between manger and goûter in French, the two giants of Russian literature present contrasting treatments of eating and sex as the physical paradigms for power and pleasure. If Dostoevsky likes to devour, digest, and destroy, Tolstoy prefers to taste, enjoy, and nourish. Now, despite the fact that Tolstoy later produced a work called The First Step, which was hailed as the best work of international vegetarian literature, we should recall that the episode where Levin and Oblonsky go to a Moscow restaurant to share a meal in part one of Anna Karenina has become one of the most celebrated and most scrutinized scenes of dining in all of world literature. The fond references to food and drink that one frequently finds in the prose fiction of Gogol, for another example, are commonly explained as the manifestations of the attempt of this sexually repressed author to hasten a retreat from love. His orally fixated characters compensate for their paralyzing fear of sex through their great love of eating. Whereas in Gogol's world, one must choose either food or sex, in Tolstoy's, one can enjoy them both. Now, whoever deals with food in Russia always thinks of service à la russe. That is the way meals are served today, one course after the other with the plates being removed from in front of individual uh, diners between the courses. The, this method of serving replaced the service à la française in Europe sometime in the 19th century. The French way of serving was to place all the platters for a service on the table at the same time for a more communal experience. Now, I'd be remiss if I did not dispel the impression that the legendarily unsophisticated fare of England 
has deterred authors from reflecting aspects of gastronomy and hospitality in English literature. One has to think only of Dickens, his love of feasts, his passion for communion through ceremony, and his interest in portraying moral values through consumption, from a Christmas carol through Bleak House to Great Expectations to see that food of whatever quality informs great works. It would explode the bounds of this paper to perform incursions into other literatures and other media, such as Isaac Dinenson's Babette's Feast, which has finally been studied from a gastrocritical point of view just recently by Priscilla Ferguson. Nor will we venture into non-Western art where, to choose but one instance among scores, Ang Lee's Eat, Drink, Man, Woman shows that food is a staple of Oriental cinema. In fact, the director himself is quoted as saying that Chinese food is pure cinema. But just before moving into things French, let's ask a fundamental question. Why, with this wealth of literature on food and food in literature, has the study of the elementary and creative writing gone relatively untreated until just recently? After all, few things seem to lend themselves more easily to conceptualization than the art and the act of self-nourishment. Is it possible that the very proximity of these functions explains the degree to which they are generally ignored or poorly understood? Pascal once said that you can notice a variety of principles if only you turn your head in their direction, but you do have to turn your head. Now, while the analysis of taste and consumption has yet to be the object of a widely received theory, unless the German sociologist Norbert Elias is someday hailed as the Marx of gastronomy, some stimulating thought has been addressed to the fundamental operation of self-nourishment as an activity that replenishes the body, brings us together in a significant social right, and opens the door to the rest of creation through absorbing into our being elements from the outside world. Much of this form of investigation has been carried on by sociologists and anthropologists because eating constitutes the point of contact between the social and the anthropological being. In fact, in their enlightened synthesis, Consuming Passions, a wonderful book, Farb and Armalagos point out that, quote, human behavior has evolved in great part as an interplay between eating behavior and cultural institutions. Cultural traits, social institutions, national histories and individual attitudes cannot be entirely understood without an understanding also of how these have meshed with our varied and peculiar modes of eating. Uh, eating or ingestion is but one aspect of the whole art or science of gastronomy, an undertaking of critical significance to the preservation of the species. Indeed, the symbolic history of the Judeo-Christian tradition opens with the episode of the tasting of the fruit in the garden. Uh, eating precedes sexual shame. Food comes, therefore, before eroticism, or sometimes during. But this is a family talk, so I won't go into that. <laughs> the two are linked by the mouth, and the connection is such that the same vocabulary is used for eating as for sexual satisfaction, hunger, desire, consummation, etc. And so, if the original couple's sin of pride has been emphasized, we have tended to overlook the fact that the first act of disobedience was an act of ingestion. Food was intimately involved in the breaking of the law. Now, gastronomy is always a question of laws, for the etymology of the word that first appeared in French in 1623 spells it out, the nomos or rules of the gastros or stomach. Such a vital activity eventually had to be transformed into literature adopting every form of symbolism from the poetic celebration of birth through the salt placed on the tongue at baptism and the rites of first communion and marriage to the gastro-literary traditions associated with victory and death. Mythology teaches us in the story of Cadmus that ingestion and expression are allied activities. Cadmus was responsible for bringing the, the uh, science of writing to Greece. But since he was also in charge of the King of Sidon's kitchen, the analogy is clear. Language and gastronomy have a common basis in a shared system of articulation, in questions of taste and pleasure, and even in lending themselves to systematic analysis. History recalls the tale of the Roman Emperor Heliogabalus, who occasionally had his dinner table covered with tablecloths on which were embroidered all the different courses 
that would be presented at mealtime, thereby creating not only the first illustrated menu, but also the first book, starting with a table of contents. <laughs> to look for and at the gastronomy of, uh, gastronomical metaphors encoded in literature is therefore to discover, ultimately, that flesh has become the word, that there is a body language in literary discourse. Yet, what could be more normal than to, than to find literature reflecting the two acts by which the human species distinguishes itself to eat rather than to feed and to speak or write? We perform oral acts then in the course of a meal whose culinary grammar has determined the choice, preparation, and consumption of food. But just as we are nourished by food, so too are we restored, restaurant, restauration, hmm? with dreams, symbols, myths, signs of all, of all kinds. One can see, therefore, that gastronomy and literature have strong ties because eating is paradigmatic of literary acts. To imagine or dream, to nourish intellectually, we talk about food for thought, we talk about one's alma mater, one's nourishing mother. To dominate or devour someone, to copulate, to fill an ontological void, to know and to know oneself. Gastrocriticism serves to place in the foreground both of the arts with which it deals and it so doing reveals that the poet and the cook are both supreme creators of metamorphosis and illusion. And if there's anything which sort of uh, typifies all cooking, it is metamorphosis. Huh? The kitchen is the lo locus of the trans uh, transformation for the cook. Food is disguised through presentation and preparation, the latter often requiring fire that the chef, as a new Prometheus, has stolen from the gods for the benefit of humans. The cook and the poet both work at bricolage, making something new out of something old. Through a process of selection, renovation, and imagination, they perform a creative act that produces original, complex products. In so doing, they change the consumer emotionally, intellectually, and of course, physically. Humanity has found that the need to eat touches every aspect of life. It is the foundation of every economic system. It is an integral part of political and domestic strategies. It marks the boundaries that separate or unite a community and even the way individuals conceive of themselves. I wonder how many books there are devoted to women and food. It constitutes the very archive where the dossier of an age is filed. But let's finally pass on to France, surely the Western country most obsessed with gastronomy. How else can one explain the recent proposal to UNESCO by the French government that French gastronomy should be inscribed on the list of humanity's legacy, along with the Eiffel Tower, the Taj Mahal, and other buildings? <laughs> A rather arrogant proposal, it seems to me, but nonetheless. Uh, when indeed we come to France, uh, we note straight away that medieval Europe, including France, fell under the spell of spices from the Orient. A result although it is impossible, impossible or at least very difficult for us now to know how medieval food really tasted, may have been that all of the heavily spiced food tasted the same. The Middle Ages were also known for the importance attached to the spectacle of alimentation. At a festival of the pheasant in Lille in 1433, for instance, a pâté was brought in that contained 28 men playing a variety of musical instruments. Jean-François Rovel in Culture and Cuisine, in French, En Festin, En Parole, recalls that the marriage of Charles the Bold with Margaret of York in 1408, 1468, uh, when an entire whale was hauled into the room. Uh, according to Stephen Manel, quote, the break with medieval cookery, which seems to have begun in the city courts of Renaissance Italy and spread to the noble courts of 17th and 18th century France, involved the shift in emphasis from quantitative display to qualitative elaboration, end quote. Manel, as a disciple of uh, Norbert Elias, is elucidating the process that eventually led to the relatively refined taste reflected in 17th century French cookbooks. Now, whereas the Renaissance was interested in the display of creativity, even if ephemeral creations like words and food can disappear shortly after being composed, Classicism sought to channel inventiveness and to preserve its product. It is no surprise, therefore, that the modern French cookbook was born in the 17th century. A stricter sense of etiquette, a taste for more delicate savors, 
a preference for the natural, even in the visual appearance of meats. And of course, every revolution in cooking in whatever country always says that they're getting back to the natural. They always say that. Um, but in France, these were reflected in the cookbooks that succeed one another at a rapid pace in the course of the century. The first was, to be sure, the famous Le Cuisinier Francais, the French cook by Pierre-Francois de la Varenne, published in 1651. The rational order, relatively speaking, of Le Cuisinier Francais explains its wide, widespread attribution as the first modern cookbook to be published in France. Like Malherbe in literature and Descartes in philosophy, La Varenne sought achievement through process and a process governed by style and rules. The preface of his publisher, Pierre David, also speaks to that nationalistic sentiment that characterized much Renaissance and 17th century writing. Quote, our France being superior to all other nations in the world in its civility, courtesy, and decorum is no less esteemed for its honest and refined lifestyle. Vive la France. <laughs> the influence of the church makes itself felt in the book by the division of recipes into those suitable for jour maigre and jour gras, that is, uh, skinny days and fat days, uh, days of, of fast and abstinence and days when you could eat regularly. Moreover, uh, La Varenne and his competitors are clearly appealing to uh, what food historian Jean-Louis Flandrin calls a new criterion of social distinction, that is, good taste. The social rivalry characteristic of noble, particularly court life in the 17th century, caused the search for distinction, whether it be in the displays of etiquette, dress, ritual, or of art, architecture, and the consumption of refined cuisine. Stephen Manel's thesis seems especially relevant at this point, and I quote, the overwhelming evidence is that people come positively to like foods which developing social standards define as desirable. Social competition would explain, therefore, why people's taste would change from the highly seasoned cooking of the Middle Ages to a style of cuisine that would dispense with much spicing in order to give, again, natural and individual taste to food. This phenomenon brought unaccustomed attention to what Montaigne called la science de gueule, uh, the science of the mouth, and specifically to chefs. Louis XIV even gave some of his kitchen personnel, his officers as he called them, the right to wear a sword. It also becomes clear that if there eventually existed a system of patronage for artists at this time, something resembling it took hold in the culinary domain. For those who compose cookbooks, direct the reader's attention at some point to the illustrious personage or personages for whom they had prepared the uh, dishes described. La Varenne, for example, formed part of the household of the Marquis d'Uxelles. Bonnefant, the author of another famous cookbook of, of the period, The Delicacies of the Country, was Louis XIV's valet de chambre. The patron par excellence, Louis XIV, seems to have had his residence built under the sign of cuisine, so to speak, since the chapel at Versailles was dedicated to Saint Roche, patron saint of cooks. Considering that uh, certain gastronomical practices at court are reflected in Molière's theater, it might be instructed to review what typically happened at mealtime for Molière's Messinus. Since he consumed enormous quantities of food, Louis XIV was forever plagued by intestinal disorders and their consequences, all of which are chronicled in the Journal de Santé du Roi, the, the uh, almanac in a way of the, of the king's health. He usually dined at one o'clock and supped at 10, therefore, uh, therefore uh, obliging the courtiers to dine at noon and to have their supper between seven and eight if they were to attend to the king. Now, like Monsieur Jourdain of Molière's The Imaginary Nobleman, who fingers every morsel touched by his cherished marquise, Louis disdained the use of the fork. He preferred to bring his food from platter, platters or bowls to a ceramic plate rather than to the piece of wood or hardened bread, the tranchoir, which had seen centuries of service until it was finally replaced around mid 17th century. Gentlemen valet, and gentlemen servants wearing a napkin over one shoulder attended him. On the table, covered by a tablecloth which more often than not extended to the floor on all sides, was a service à la française. The time for the dishes to be carried a quarter of a mile at Versailles uh, and served not individu individually as today but communally 
was such that most meals in the age of Louis XIV and before were lukewarm at the very best. A typical meal would consist of three services, starting with a potage and an entree, then a roast, some side dishes called entremets, and a dessert course. All of this was subject to codes, of course, culinary, social, political, depending on the circumstance. That is, the regulatory aspects of classicism defined gastronomy as they did the other arts. To explore the relationship between language and gastronomy in the age of classicism is to penetrate uncharted territory, since literary scholars have focused their attention, understandably enough, on periods when a realistic mode dominated literary production and when consequently the management of basic needs was abundantly reflected in the writing of the times. Among a growing number of scholars of the language of cuisine in French literature, one finds therefore an almost uh, exclusive preoccupation with novels of the 19th and 20th centuries, from the impressive banquet served by the Marquis de la Vaubiessard and Madame Bovary, to the Petite Madeleine in Proust du côté de chez Swann, and to the anti-gastronomy of Jean-Paul Sartre, whose own body seems to have been the philosopher's worst enemy. Sartre seems not to have had much taste for anything but food, but I'm sorry, but eggs and pastry. And I don't think I need to remind you about the title of his most famous novel, La Nausée. To be sure, scholars have tossed an occasional glance backwards at culinary comedy in the Middle Ages, the gargantuan appetites of Rabelais' characters, the peculiar anthropophagy of the Marquis de Sade, and the predominantly literary taste in matters of cuisine of Rousseau. However, the literature of the ages of Louis XIII and Louis XIV has barely been touched for the art of the century, dubbed classical for the most part, investigates the inner being, offers generalizations on the human condition, and would appear therefore to have little place for those forms of conduct that reflect the concrete aspects of everyday existence. Baudelaire once said, avez-vous jamais vu boire et manger des personnages tragiques? Have you ever seen uh, 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 characters from tragedy drink and eat? And that is the source of uh, the point of view of uh, French classicism as decorporalized. As the author generally considered as representing the acme of French classicism, Jean Racine will serve as the best example of the oft-noted sensory deprivation of characters in serious literature of the 17th century. For example, there were only two meals of any kind in all of Racine's theater, banquets, and they take place offstage in Britannicus and Esther. Moreover, the senses of taste and smell have little place in tragedy thanks to the prescriptive force of the rule of tragic decorum. The point of all of this, whether it concerns Racine specifically or French classical art in general, seems to be that to use Bakhtin's phrase about Rabelais, the principle of corporal and material life is apparently absent from the 17th century, or at least from serious art since everyone will recognize elementary terms as part of burlesque treatments throughout the ages from Horace's satiric meal to Boileau's repas ridicule uh, with its rollicking expose of the sights, smells, tastes, and especially sounds of a repulsive meal that ends in a bout of food in the face worthy of Max Sennett. Among the writers of memoirs and letters, Talmont des Rayaux, Héros de Gouville, the Princess Palatine, Madame de Maintenon, and especially Saint-Simon and Madame de Sévigné, um, these people at command attention for their gastronomical reminiscences. If the eyes of a cultivated reader will glaze over nonplussed at the mention of gastronomy in classical French literature in the narrow sense, they will sparkle with recognition at the retelling of a Sévigné anecdote. Uh, for example, the passion for the pea that uh, seized France in the last quarter of the century, or of Vatel's suicide after he concluded that there did not remain enough fish to serve the king's table, the social acceptance of the new brew coffee, including uh, involving a person whose name, Mutefaraka, barely modified, turns up in Molière's Bourgeois Gentillam, the invention of champagne by the Franciscan monk Don Perignon around 1690, the spectacular banquets at Versailles, and Louis XIV's stomach discovered upon autopsy, autopsy to be twice the normal size. All are well-known tales from the world of 17th century gastronomy. Now, if gastronomy in 17th century prose and poetry has not gone unnoticed, although the field is surely wide open, 
Nothing has been done on theater until my book appeared, despite a few facts that might well have offered food for thought. For one thing, food and drink have always been the primary preoccupation of valets in comedy, from Gros René and Jodelet through Mascari to the Scannerelle of Molière's Don Juan. For another, there is the remarkable coincidence between art and life, or rather a transition from the former to the latter, which often took place in the 17th century and is, which has drawn no attention. If, as we know, under Louis XIV, plays usually began at five o'clock, then the audience must have left the theater around eight o'clock, supper time, just after having been enjoined to seek out a communal meal by Moliere uh, at the end of one of his plays. The first play attributed to Moliere, La Jalousie du Barbouillet, has the following last line by, by, by Villebroquin. Allons-nous en souper ensemble, nous autres. Let's all go to supper together. While his second comedy, Le Médecin Volant, ends with Gorgibus exclaiming, more to the audience than to the actors, Allons tous faire noce et boire à la santé de toute la compagnie. Let's have the marriage and drink to the health of, of everyone. This form of closure may be, to some extent, an imitation of Plautus, where the audience is occasionally invited to an imaginary banquet afterwards. But to reiterate, to, in Moliere, the encouragement to sup coincides with the need and the intention of the departing spectators. In terms of the theory of the comic, Charles Moron reminded us years ago that food has to play an enormous role in comedy because phantasms about it derive from the most primitive and profound anxiety in all of us, a feeling that was unquestionably deepened for the 17th century subject by the series of famines that France experienced during the period. It is also true that an act of communion with the audience as the curtain lowers is eminently proper, since the repast constitutes a symbol of rebirth and renewal that accompanies the establishment of a new and uh, ideal order. Let me offer as my final course some thoughts on Moliere, perhaps France's most popular author. At the dawn of the modern age, Moliere questions the values that characterize French culture starting with the mid-17th century. In fact, Moliere's sense of the ridiculous, of the laughable, arises from his perception of the traditional attitude toward the body, and especially towards certain oral acts, to drink, to eat, and to speak. Moreover, in suggesting that the narcissism shared by all of his main characters is inherent in modern culture, Moliere is denouncing the detachment of desire from physical need. This disjunction, which is particularly evident in his play Don Juan, Don Juan, succeeds in arousing a general, inextinguishable, and infectious desire. Maria Seda reflects, therefore, the mechanisms of consumer society. Conspicuous consumption, the hallmark of the modern era, ever seeks to cloak itself under the guise of collective well-being, but it ever also betrays its origins in very specific needs. It is, for example, in the name of civility that one finds in Moliere the most self-centered and perverse of instincts, the desire to monopolize appetite, to separate individual want from communal need, ultimately to deny the body. For instance, in the learned ladies, les femmes savantes, the eponymous women would like to, de to de dematerialize, desexualize, starve the body, all the while clearly revealing the very corporeal drives that underlie their pretentious and bookish discourse. As with all the impostures in Moliere, this kind of hypocrisy will be punished by laughter, which reaffirms the primacy of the body in a genre that celebrates the body and whose typical denouement consists in union, a marriage, or communion, a banquet. In undertaking a gastronomical study of Moliere's comedies, I immediately discovered that I would have to bring to bear a different approach for each of the 10 plays that proved to be fruitful. This only uh, underscored the interdiscipl interdisciplinary nature of my method. In fact, if there is an approach that challenges the boundaries of traditional disciplines, it is surely gastrocriticism, which is not a grill that one applies, but rather a network of techniques supporting a concept. I began with a semiotic analysis of L'Eco des Femmes, School for Wives, hmm? then turned to considerations of taste and aesthetic for La Critique de L'Eco des Femmes, to pleasure and communion in Don Juan, to mercantilism and the practice of hospitality in Amphitryon, 
to mise en abîme in the bourgeois gentilhomme, to spiritual anorexia in les femmes savantes, and finally to questions of corporality and medical treatment in le maladie imaginaire, the imaginary invalid. But the richest play for my purposes was Lavar, the miser. You have a major domo who performs his oversight of the house according to the 17th century Bible of household management, la maison réglée, the well-ordered house. There is a coachman-cook-maître d'hôtel wrapped up in one character, servants with alimentary names, and an eponymous character who undertakes superhuman efforts to conserve and preserve in every area except the most essential, the reproduction of the species. To satisfy his mania, he is driven to vampirize every object around him. His servants, who are constrained uh, to observe twice the number of fast days than normal, his horses, whose feet he steals at night, and his guests at, at a banquet. In the 1682 edition of Maria's works, the banquet is a fascinating recreation of a 17th century menu that Lavarin would surely have appreciated since he is the principal source for Maria. When asked by the miser Alpagon to conceive of a meal to celebrate his engagement, Maître Jacques permits himself a flight of culinary fancy that is guaranteed to render his miserly master apoplectic. Well, we have to have four large potage, well stocked, and five dishes of entree. A potage, bisque, partridge soup with green cabbage, health soup, vegetable soup, duck soup with turnips. Uh, these four potages, by the way, are the first four in La Varenne's uh, book on uh, uh, cookbook. Uh, entries, chicken fricassee, squab tart, sweetbread, white sausage, morals, a roast in an enormous platter in the form of a pyramid, a large loin of veal, three pheasants, three fat hens, a dozen domestic pigeons, 12 grain-fed chickens, six domestically raised young rabbits, 12 young partridges, two dozen quails, three dozen ortolans. The miser then puts his hand over Jacques's mouth as if the outpouring of words were actually an outpouring of money. Alpagon's hardness of heart causes the estrangement of his children, the cynicism of his domestic staff, and a general atmosphere of duplicity in the play. Without a doubt, it is his absence of generosity, his fundamental indifference to others, uh, well-being that explains his loneliness at the end. He is inhuman in the sense that he is inanimate, without a soul or with a reified one. He ultimately betrays the feeling of commensality in its basic meaning. Commensality comes from the Latin word mensa, table, and its root is in the word, is in the verb meteor, meaning to measure, to give its just proportion. Ingestion has to do, therefore, not only with metabolism, but with morality. As a truly human event, the repast is the opportunity to nourish the soul while fortifying the body. The miser has dictated that those around him spend their lives, or a great part thereof, fasting, because ultimately uh, the f his function consists in playing the killjoy in a genre devoted to joy and pleasure. As seen from the angle of gastrocriticism, the miser Arpagon is, in his desire to suppress the life force the most sinister figure of French classical comedy. I cannot leave you with the impression that my approach is a key that opens all doors to Maria's theater. For some plays like Tartuffe, curiously enough, the gastronom gastronomical images prove to be without great import. But I also found that sometimes zero is as good as 100. When you come upon a play that is composed uniquely of scenes of social encounters, and surprisingly, it contains not a single meal or offer of finger food, as etiquette would normally require, you understand that the lack of commensality and conviviality says a great deal about the barrenness of human relations in the misanthrope. A gastrocriticism is capable of illustrating the various comic subgenres of Moliere from the farce and the comedie d'intrigue through the bright plays and the darker ones to the comedy ballets. This is undoubtedly owing to the fact that Molière's monoman, his main characters who are obsessive creatures, are not true gourmet. They, if they insist upon satisfying their appetites, they are ignorant of the rules of cultural process. By creating these hosts and guests who are unfamiliar with table etiquette, Molière implicitly tips his hat to the true gastronomes who would not fail to appreciate an author capable of adding a rich 
gastronomical dimension to the texture of his comedies. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. And I would like to ask you, uh, was it Descartes that talked about le théâtre de la digestion? I don't recall that. By talking about people who go to, uh, used to go to watch the plays, but before the play, they will have the soupé before. And I think he was talking about the fact that people went to the play to digest their food. <laughs> Hence, that's, that's, le théâtre de la digestion. That's a new one on me, but I'll have to look that up. That's really, that's really very interesting, because it, normally you went afterwards. But if you, if you went beforehand, there might have been some explosive um, aspects to the, th to the audience. At the, I mean, it was bad enough that they threw tomatoes and, uh, and french fries at the, at the stage anyway. But if they also had to deal with that, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the... the um uh, the cultural anthropologist Jack Goody has also been an observer of culinary culture. And there was an article by him I read recently where uh, he talks about um, cookbooks. And he, he differentiates two kinds of cookbooks. And this gets into the, the uh, cuisinier francais and how that was ad adapted by Moyet in his, mm -hmm. uh, in his plays. But he was indicating that there there was a kind of cookbook which was written to give instructions on how actually to cook something mm -hmm. in very detail, you know, more or less designed for someone in the kitchen. But he also indicated there's another genre of cookbooks which was meant to be aesthetically enjoyed as you read through the recipes. In other words, a literature in, uh, it, itself. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, sort yeah. of you know, thinking about your knowledge of cookbooks as well as in yeah. the French context. Well, um, Everything is relative, I guess, in cookbooks. When, when La Varenne wrote his, uh, his the True French Cook, and in some versions of it, it is called the True French Cook. In other words, uh, La Varenne is, is distinguishing French cuisine from Italian cuisine because the, the word was that everything came from Italy. Uh, and he's saying, no, we're stopping that business, and from now on, it's going to be the True French Cook. Um, he, uh, he, it's, his book is somewhere in between because uh, he never offers any notion at all on how much of a particular ingredient you're supposed to put in. He doesn't even say a pinch, you know, whatever a pinch might be for someone. But so uh, on the one hand, it is f easy reading because at least it's um, rationally conceived. You know, there are recipes that follow one another rather than what used to be the case 150 years before when just anything was thrown in, not even in alphabetical fashion. Um, but uh, he, I think these people were writing also to reflect the fact that they were associated with major noble houses at the time, and so they didn't want to disgrace the house by saying that this person who worked for the Marquis d'Uxelles didn't know how to write a reasonably um, literate kind of book. So you have the, the things which are sort of in between. When you get into the 18th century, which is really the high point of French gastronomy, um, you have people who uh, become so literate. I mean, the first real, um, I guess we would call it a, a kind of a gastronomical magazine uh, called L'Almanac des Muses um, is by a man named Grimaud de la Rignière. And he would put this out every month and it was so beautifully written that people couldn't wait to read it. Uh, but, it but sometimes the sentiments that were expressed were also very, very, uh, uh, edgy because he would criticize. It's the, it's the first um, magazine in which you have criticisms of uh, restaurants and things like that. And he gathered people together and they all sort of gave their opinion on things. So that's very well written. And from then on, you have people who in fact really deal in um, cr uh, writing, for f writing about food as literature. Uh, one of his contemporaries, a man named Karen, decided that food was less like um, painting and it was more like architecture and so he's the one responsible for these huge desserts which go up like this this high and in all different shapes and so forth so food as architecture uh, so food <laughs> it becomes uh, an art in, in just about every other way but there is that tendency I must say that when I got into reading about um, food ways that uh, it was wonderful because the people who wrote about food wrote with such joy and enthusiasm that it made reading whatever they wrote uh, totally compelling. Uh, it's, I've not always found that in my research, 
but in, uh, <laughs> when it has to do with food, it's wonderful. And you know, even people who are not as gifted literarily as, uh, as Fisher is, or someone like that, you know, it was a, a, a real, um, I mean, she, should, she could receive the Nobel Prize for literature one of these days, you know, she's so good. Yeah, so. Hey, John. I much enjoyed your uh, comments on comedy and food, uh, Ron, which obviously is a very ancient uh, 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 tradition indeed. But it's interesting to think about the Commedia dell'arte uh, tradition. I mean, the, the Italian players were coming to Paris by the 1570s that we know of, probably earlier, but we know they were there by then. And uh, there isn't a Commedia dell'arte script that doesn't involve the problem of food uh, for the lower classes, uh, particularly Arlecchino, if he's in the play, but it could be, right. could be Trivellino, who used to be a servant and has now moved up to being an innkeeper, which really means a cook uh, yeah. more than anything else, an Oste. Uh, and there are these wonderful Arlecchino um, uh, stunts. Uh, for instance, he, he's always hungry and he has just a crumb of bread in his pocket uh, and that's all he has to eat so he ties a string to it and he, he'll eat it and bring it back up again and <laughs> eat it again and do that repeatedly. Um, or he'll be so hungry he'll see a flea going by and he'll grab the flea mm -hmm. and eat it and then begin to bounce all over the stage with the <laughs> flea inside of him. But um, uh, the other thing, and I know that these were very important for the French theater later on, um, and I guess the Italian players were either popular or unpopular, depending on your point of view, in the 17th century in France. Um, on another front, uh, certainly at the papal court in 17th century um, Rome, uh, uh, banquets were, uh, were basically spectacles where maybe only two or three people would eat these spectacular displays of food and thousands of people would come to be spectators at the display of food uh, on the tables and would watch, say, when Queen Christina came to Rome and converted to Roman Catholicism, there was such, a, uh, such an event um, around, when, when was that, in the 1660s, I think? Anyway, that's yeah, all. Okay. Um, yeah, Arlacchino was wonderful. There's, um, uh, there's a whole tradition of Don Juan plays in both Italy and France and in the uh, in Maria's Don Juan play, um, the servant uh, Scannerel never gets to eat. Every time he's about to, to eat, someone takes the plate out from underneath him. Uh, in a one of the Italian versions with uh, Arlecchino, um, he eats when nobody's there. He steals a, a ham bone and is chewing away on it, and so people keep on chasing him out of the kitchen. And at one point, he can't really get near the food, so he takes a fishing pole. <laughs> and uses a fly rod and picks up the ham <laughs> that way and takes it out of the room. And, but he, eat, he, he does nothing but eat, whereas the, in the uh, Madia version, uh, the servant never gets to eat. It's sort of one of the, the sad things about, uh, about Don Juan. Uh, everyone seems to, to be deprived of their source of joy. That's true. Yes, Dominique. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on what seems to me an obsession with table manners um, in, in the 17th century. So uh, not just food, but ways of eating it. It, it seems to me that um, writers pay a lot of attention to particularly characters with revolting table manners um, <laughs> at, at this time. <laughs> well, that's, that's part of a long tradition. I mean, France has made uh, a whole diplomatic art out of having banquets at which people eat. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, but it is true. Uh, we were talking before about Louis XIV and his stomach being twice the normal size and so forth. Um, and uh, he didn't go in for the refinement of a fork. He just didn't like the fork. He thought that this, what looked basically looked like a knife with two prongs on it, would be dangerous. So he ate with his hands, as did uh, an awful lot of people at, at the time. But by the time you get to the 18th century, almost all of the refinements of table manners seem to be pretty much set. And then you can really say, OK, this person doesn't know how to act at table, and this other person does. Uh, you have, in, in Saint-Simon, you have, a, you have a, a lot of descriptions of people who don't know how to act at table. Uh, and of course, from his point of view, they shouldn't be at table in the first place because they are not true noble persons. I mean, that's, that's Sassimo, but table manners become very important uh, in France, again, as one of those criteria of distinction that we were talking about previously. Uh, it comes in with the courts, and it seems to stay throughout after that. 
Um, that's, in the long run, I suppose, that's the real distinction between the cuisine tradition, the gastronomical tradition in France and in a place like England is that I the French tradition is a noble tradition and in England it is not. And uh, so that seems to follow through with the high art and the expectations for table manners coming and staying down pretty much throughout the history of, uh, of French culinary tradition. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you.